Welcome to Moriel TV this Friday, January 25th for This Week in Prophecy, live with James Jacob Prash. Jacob. Blessings in Jesus, dear friends, and greetings. Wonderful to be with you. Although the times in which we are presently finding ourselves are indeed perilous. It is Jesus said, when you see these things happening, lift up your head for your redemption draws nigh. We've pointed out a number of times that in one of the synoptic versions of the Olivet Discourse, Jesus says, you'll be brought before magistrates, the legal system, and kings, for my name's sake. What we are witnessing this week in prophecy and have been witnessing for some time is an attack on democracy through the court system. Now, this began, as we've said before, in California, certainly it gained momentum with Proposition 8. The people democratically voted for it. A homosexual judge outlawed it, setting himself up over the people, not decided by legislature, not decided by referendum but of a homosexual judge outlawing it. And in his decision, he blamed Christianity for homophobia in a legal document written by the court. Now, this person should be removed from the bench in an ideal world criminally sentenced, but he won't be. It's what Jesus said would happen. The world was in the power of the wicked one. And in the United States, it's no exception, only in some states it's worse than others. California and my native New York being two of the worst. This week in prophecy in New York, the state legislature against all, against all medical evidence has voted to allow abortion up until the time of birth. Fetuses that could easily survive, easily survive, not all of them even in incubators are simply being terminated. And to celebrate the Freedom Tower that replaced the World Trade Center was lit up in pink, shaking their fist at the Almighty. Quite a situation this week in prophecy. Even the Roman Catholic Church denounced the governor, Andrew Cuomo, for signing it into legislation. We remember Andrew Cuomo, the son of Mario Cuomo, was the primary architect of the subprime lending that caused the economic disaster of 2008 under the Clinton administration. He was the primary architect of this. Now he's the governor of New York. And people were cheering it. Can you imagine a baby that can survive at seven, eight, nine fetal months being terminated? This will bring the judgment of God. I lost a relative in the Twin Towers. When the World Trade Center came down, 3,000 Americans were killed, but I point out at that time, that is how many babies are aborted every day in the United States with no clinical warrant, and no one says anything. Now. The monument of the September 11 attacks, the Freedom Tower, 1,776 feet high, is illuminated in pink to celebrate killing babies that can survive outside their mother's womb. At the same time, another judge in the state of Iowa has outlawed legislation passed by the elected representatives of the people saying that once a fetal heartbeat is detected, abortion can no longer be legally performed. And a judge overrules it. Very soon, one of these judges will be standing before the real judge. Ruth Ginsburg will be standing before the Almighty. She will realize as a Jew that the Torah she didn't care about will be her indictment. If two men are in a tussle and one causes a woman to miscarry, they're essentially guilty of murder. 
And of course, in the New Testament, John the Baptist recognized Jesus from his mother's womb. She will stand before the God of her fathers and be judged on the basis of the Torah she didn't care about. It is very unlikely that that woman will be saved. I would hope, even pray, she would be somehow, but it's most unlikely. She is of that type that God gives over. These judges will stand before these judge, and when they stand before the judge, they will be sentenced to eternity in the lake of fire. They may not believe there's a lake of fire, but when they get there, they will. Hell enlarges its mouth for those given to it. That's what's waiting for Ruth Ginsburg and for these other judges. We've said many times that for real democracy to work, it can only work if we're governed by people who are governed by God. It can only work based on Judeo-Christian biblical principles. In ancient Athens, it began but failed. Rome, as Cicero decried it, went from being a republic to an imperial dictatorship. The earliest forms of democracy became failures and went into oppression and dictatorship. Why? When democracy finally emerged in the Western world, for all of their mistakes and faults, as I've said many times, the founding fathers of America were not perfect men. Some of them were Masons, slave owners. Some of them were atheists or agnostics like Benjamin Franklin and Thomas Paine. I don't have an illusion about the Founding Fathers being these dedicated Christian men. Some were, some were not. But even the ones who were not, such as Thomas Jefferson, at least adhered to the moral principles of the Judeo-Christian scriptures. The founders of parliamentary democracy in Great Britain, the same, the Puritans, had many things wrong and did many things wrong, but they understood Unless democracy, parliamentary democracy, is built on biblical principles, it will not survive, and it is not surviving. What we are seeing this week in prophecy in Great Britain, with the ongoing Brexit crisis, people in the rest of the world, particularly the Commonwealth countries and the United States, need to understand that what's happening in Britain now, is the equivalent of an American constitutional crisis, except it is the greatest crisis of its type since the 17th century, since the time of Cromwell and the English Civil War. Theresa May, who again I regard as a detestable, pathetic figure. When the nation voted Brexit, there should have been a Brexit prime minister. But the establishment wanted a pro-Remain prime minister, so she was ushered into number 10 Downing Street by the Tory party establishment against the will of the rank and file membership of the party. Then she calls a general election and nearly loses, as we've said repeatedly, the Northern Irish, most of whom were evangelical Christians, saved her neck. Now this woman has suffered the biggest defeat in parliamentary history, the rejection of her Brexit plan that would keep Britain and Europe in all but name, still under the thumb of the Brussels unelected socialist bureaucracy, only Britain, of course, not being in the EU, would not even have a voice in it. She was determined to make Britain an offshore colony governed from abroad with no democratic input from the British people. And now we see Donald Tusk, not Donald Trump, but Tusk, the president of the European Union, calling for another referendum. Jeremy Corbyn, leader of the Labour opposition, 
saying that Labour will now accept a second referendum. This is dirty Irish politics. It's what happens in the Republic of Ireland consistently. When the people by referendum vote for something that the Irish political establishment does not want, the government calls another referendum until they eventually get the result they want. Democracy being thrown out the window. When we've turned away from the Judeo-Christian biblical principles that engendered democracy and facilitated its success as its moral lifeblood, democracy begins to disappear. In the United States, the electoral will of the people was countermanded by the left-wing establishment who begin misusing the judiciary to try to reverse an election. Again, the complete folly of the Mueller investigations. He was part of the culture of corruption in the Justice Department. Most of his staff and prosecutors are left-wing Democrats with an anti-Trump agenda. It's completely politically motivated, and they haven't come up with anything indictable or impeachable for President Trump since they've been operating. It's just a political exercise taking place under the guise of being judicial. Well, Jesus said this will happen. It'll be a great day when these judges stand before the real judge. When the Supreme Court finds out it is not the supreme being. Come quickly, Lord Jesus. In the meantime, in Britain and in Europe, once more, Daniel 2, the ongoing desperation to make the iron stick to the clay. The people voted to leave Europe, and the people voted for parliamentarians who agreed to support the referendum and to leave by the 29th of March. Now, the majority of the British Parliament do not want to leave Europe against the will of the people. So they're moving for another referendum that can be engineered the way they want it to go. What you have here is a coup d'etat, as Melanie Phillips rightly described it, an unsaved Jewish woman, please pray for her, for her salvation. I love her politically, and as a journalist, I'd love her to be saved. There are so many Jewish people out there with common sense who are speaking the truth. Ben Shapiro, Dennis Prager, Michael Savage, Mark Levin, every one of them Jewish. I only pray that they come to faith in their Messiah, Yeshua. They see what's happening. They just don't see the full prophetic dimension of why it is happening. May God, the God of their fathers, open their eyes. In the meanwhile, iron and clay do not adhere, but try and try they will. This week in prophecy, we move on to the Middle East. The dramatic Israeli airstrikes on Iran help explain the lull in Israeli airstrikes that took place between October and December. It was obvious at that time when the United States was increasing its aerial operations over Syria that there was intense reconnaissance efforts taking place to understand the capability of the S-300 anti-aircraft missile systems provided by Russia to Syria. The Israelis undoubtedly were carrying on reconnaissance operations of their own in unison with the Americans. For some reason, the S-300 was not fired against the Israelis who made the dramatic attacks 
this week in prophecy against Iranian targets. The Iranians were specifically targeted. Approximately 21 known dead, most if not all of them, Iranian Republican guards. Not Hezbollah, who are Iranian surrogates, not primarily Assad Syrians, but Iranians. Direct attacks by the Israelis on Iranian positions. The S-300 did not even come into play. It is somewhat speculated that the Syrians do not have the technical expertise for that kind of operation without the assistance of the Russians. It may be that American type harm, that's what they're called, harm missile technology, in the hands of the Israelis, accounts for why that did not happen. The harm missile homes on to the source of radar for the guidance system for the missile and attacks not the launcher, but follows the radar signal. There are more advanced models of harm that are available. This may be a factor in the equation. It is obviously something not being discussed. But the reaction by Mr. Putin was instant. He was warning the Israelis to stop bombing Syria. The Israelis said they're going to continue anti-Iranian operations. A green light was given to Israel by the Trump administration yesterday, this week in prophecy, to carry out attacks in Iraq against Iranian-backed militias. Hence, it is not simply Syria, but the United States has given the go-ahead to the Israelis to attack Iranian-backed forces in Iraq, moving towards Syria. This is expanding, and it's expanding dramatically. The Iranians responded in league with the Syrians by firing a missile towards an Israeli position near Mount Hermon, Har Hermon. It was downed by the Israeli dome system. The Iron Dome downed it. However, what has happened now, the Assyrian foreign minister has announced that if Israeli airstrikes against Damascus International Airport do not stop, which is where Iranian supplies are being flown into, among other bases, that Ben-Gurion Airport near Tel Aviv, Lod Airport, Israel's main international commercial air venue, will be attacked from Syria. This raises the stakes dramatically. At the same time, the Iranians, angered at having had Iranian Revolutionary Guard personnel killed by the Israelis, are threatening Israel's extinction once again. Soleimani, the Israeli main opponent, who is the commander of the Revolutionary Guards, delivered another robust speech, not just threatening Israel, but almost promising. This very much pushes things closer to a brink. Something can indeed happen. We are left wondering, is the American pullout of Syria something taking place so the Israelis can conduct an intensive operation of destruction, not against the Kurds, but against the Syrian and Iranian opposition without having Americans in harm's way. The Turkish government 
is very concerned about the vacuum left by the Americans because of Kurdish nationalism. The Turkish foreign minister made the claim that Turkey can create a buffer zone and he's willing to cooperate with Russia to do it after the Americans leave. This has begun to tip the Kurds closer towards Assad as they feel potentially abandoned by Trump. Although the Trump administration has robustly supplied the Kurds with ammunition and defensive weapons. He has, however, once again denounced Kurdish sales of oil to Iran. The relationship between the Kurds and the United States is something that should be a premium relationship for both America and the Kurds. But it never has been. They have been friends, they have been loyal, but they feel they cannot trust the United States, but feeling particularly betrayed by Barack Obama and by George Bush. Now they're beginning to have doubts about Donald Trump. But Donald Trump may have other things up his proverbial sleeves, as we shall eventually find out. Having said this, the situation in Syria begins now to seriously intensify. Forces with inside Syria open fire with small weapons fire, automatic weapons, on Israeli troop positions along the border wire of the Golan Heights. Now that's the place where tourists visit to take photos of Syria. It's as close as you can get to the conversion point of St. Paul on the Damascus Road without being on the other side of the wire. Thousands and tens of thousands of tourists visit it every year. But it came under automatic weapons fire this week in prophecy. The Israelis responded. The Israelis have also responded to Gaza with more airstrikes following the latest barrage of attacks from Gaza. In fear of what Iran may do or in anticipation of it, new Iron Dome batteries are being deployed around Tel Aviv and close to the Gaza Strip, as well as those active on the Golan Heights. Israel is making major efforts to prepare for missile attacks. The attacks by Israel on Syria likely also involved missiles fired by the Israelis, but there is less information that can be confirmed concerning this. The airstrikes, however, are well documented and well reported. Something is happening this week in prophecy. This week in prophecy, the American ambassador to Israel announced that after the upcoming Israeli elections, probably in April, the Donald Trump Middle East peace plan will be proposed. This has a number of people concerned. While there is much appreciation of Mr. Trump for moving the embassy to Jerusalem, there is also a suspicion that he will extract a repayment forcing the Israelis to make territorial concessions. I hope this proves wrong. It would be awful if Donald Trump simply set Israel up. But the Israelis are beginning to become nervous about the proposal. And they are beginning to become nervous and have been for some weeks 
concerning the American withdrawal from eastern Syria to the east of the Euphrates. Having said that, the United States is actively advising and equipping a pan-Arab force to take their place. I'm not trying to be overly suspicious or thinking Mr. Trump is dubious. I'm simply saying this is the ball, the scuttle buck, bucket, as, as, as American military says, as, as said in the U.S. Navy and Marines. It's the talk around Israel. I'm simply reporting it as that. I'm not suggesting it's true, but it is being proposed and talked about or hinted at as a possibility. At this point, however, no one knows for certain. If Mr. Trump knows, he hasn't told anyone. If he's told Mr. Netanyahu, it is not being made publicized by Mr. Netanyahu's government either. But it is quite a situation that's developing. And these things are happening this week in prophecy. We urged that the Almighty would raise his hand against these judges and against these politicians. Other states, such as Vermont and New Mexico, are threatening to follow the lead of New York and allowing abortion at any point up until the baby is born. Because of these things, the wrath of God will come. We have to understand something. What is sometimes called the Z generation, the younger millennials, seem to be more conservative and more socially conservative than the previous two generations of young people. An opposition to abortion and a belief that it should be restricted seems to be rather popular in the upcoming generation. The left is now the establishment. While CNN and TV programs such as The View and The New York Times and The Washington Post misrepresent the factual reality that it is conservatives and white males and things of this nature that are the establishment and they're the left vanguard fighting the establishment. The diametric opposite is true. They are the establishment. It is the conservatives who are now the anti-establishment. Conservatives have never really had power in the United States in the 20th century. You always had establishment Republicans, such as Nixon and Bush and Romney, but a conservative such as Goldwater, the forces united against it. You've had people who sold out to the establishment who were never really conservative in the true sense, such as Ronald Reagan, surrounded himself with establishment Republicans like Weinberger and Schultz. And, 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 and George Bush Sr. We've never had a real conservative in the White House. Donald Trump is the closest. Barry Goldwater perhaps should have been, but wasn't. No, it is the conservatives who challenge the establishment. The left plays the game the left always plays. You saw well-entrenched dictators in the communist world, the Stalinists, the old men in the Politburo in Russia, Suslav and Brezhnev and Alexei Kosygin, talking about the revolution as if they were the left. When they were an entrenched socialist bureaucracy who had the power themselves. Ceausescu did the same thing. The dictators of North Korea, the same. Mao and Cho and Lai, the same. 
they don't understand that once they get power, now they're the power. They're no longer the left. They're no longer challenging the establishment. They are the establishment. Yet, so many people are deluded. There is a fear among the establishment, dominated by the left, in both Britain and Europe, as well as America and other countries, that the next generation will be more pro-life and more conservative. Therefore, they are trying to dig their heels in to get as much control of the educational system as possible in order to indoctrinate youth. They want to keep power. They're afraid of Roe v. Wade being reversed. Now, on back of these things is a tremendous spiritual battle. Please pray for Britain concerning Brexit and this attempt by a corrupt parliament to carry out a coup d'etat against the democratic will of the British people. Pray that God raises his hand against these godless, evil judges. We see this week in prophecy, as Speaker of the House, Nancy Pelosi will not even allow the State of the Union address to take place. When has America been so divided? But on back of this is a spiritual conflict. Last week, President Trump said he would outlaw any pro-abortion agenda or legislation. He would veto it. Today, I have signed a letter to Congress to make clear that if they send any legislation to my desk that weakens the protection of human life, I will issue a veto, and we have the support to uphold those vetoes. These battles are not merely political or ideological. They are spiritual. As always, we urge prayer for President Trump and Mr. Pence, and we also certainly urge prayer for Mr. Netanyahu. Whether you like them or agree with them or not, they are in desperate need of our prayers. What we see happening, these changes in abortion laws, they're becoming more aggressive and militant demanding the right to kill the unborn, even late-term abortions, even up to 40 fetal weeks. That baby can be born normally at that time, and they say you have a legal right to kill it. Well, God will kill them with the second death. They will burn in hell. Let them mock, let them laugh. God will not be mocked. He will laugh at them. These people don't know what they're playing with. God has given them over to their murderous depravity. As Ruth Ginsburg will soon find out, the God of Israel is the real one. And he does not play around. You kill a baby. You have a blood guilt on your hands that he will not overlook unless you truly, truly repent and come to faith in his son. And that's not likely to happen with these people. But let's move on. Please pray for Britain. Pray there's a new prime minister who is not Jeremy Corbyn, an enemy of Israel and the Jewish people. Please pray that the democratic will of the people will prevail. It's called a hard Brexit, that they will not move the date, that they will not call for another referendum. These things are attacks on British democracy. In the United States, we have judicial attacks on American democracy. And it's all political. If it was not political, Hillary Clinton would have been indicted and put on trial. But it's political. Thank God there is a judge 
whose justice will be perfect. Meanwhile, we watch the clock, we read the scriptures. Jesus is indeed coming soon. Thank you so much for listening to This Week in Prophecy.